Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Good morning, Virgin Most Powerful Radio, Jesus 911. Welcome on this Friday. We uh we have a good show for you today. Uh, I'm saying we, and hoping that Jess is going to be with us. Uh, he's uh, in an undisclosed location uh, somewhere on the East Coast. Uh, so we'll figure it out if he's going to be with us or not. Uh, it's Eddie Chavez here. We're 10-8. We're 10 we got a, a ride along here, two-man car. But uh, before we do that, uh, Engineer, do we have uh, Jess with us at all or no? Okay, so we don't have Jess. All right, that's fine. So we're going to... We're going to do an interview. Uh, Jess uh, encountered an individual that uh, we uh, thought it would be great to interview. He's uh, uh, a retired police chief with uh, Loveland Police Department in Colorado. So I want to bring him on right now, uh, Mr. Luke Heckler. Are you Hecker? Are you on? I am, Eddie. How are you, sir? Good morning to you. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Of course, and, and as we always say on the show here, we're uh, we're ten eight. We're uh, we're in service, and uh, so Luke, uh, just to, to kind of update the audience, we um, <clears throat> I know you encountered Jess, or you first heard about Jess when he was doing the Taylor Marshall show, and um, and you kind of uh, you guys uh, contacted each other after that interview, and you guys uh, apparently thought uh, you were of kindred spirits. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about the uh, uh, that uh, that uh, phone call. You know, Eddie, I uh, served as ten years as the police chief in Loveland, and during that time frame, the last two years, especially between 2013 and 2015, when I retired, the devil just took his veil off, and I he was very visible. I, I watched him attack our community. I watched him attack uh, our staff, and uh, I began to, I had a very profound experience with St. Michael the Archangel during the Holy Hour, um, and uh, really recognizes that that we are in a battle, uh, like St. Paul says, with principalities and powers not of this world, but Eddie, I, I felt like I was an alien. Uh, I was working in an environment with a lot of, I know, uh, baptized Catholics as police officers, but I honestly can't remember that I there was one of them that was a practicing Catholic. And um, I went to lots of meetings and community meetings and council meetings, and there was a lot of talk about things going on in the community. And seeing the devil standing right there in front of me and having no one else recognize it, I, I just felt like I was an, an alien and maybe I, I wasn't thinking right. But I heard Jesse being interviewed actually by Al Cresta in the afternoon, and he was talking about the devil and the city of angels, a book that he had recently re, uh, written and released, and the reality of Satan and uh, his power and how he is is present and, and on the prowl, and police officers that are not armored up and prepared for this battle are they're in danger. They're 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 absolutely in peril. Yeah, absolutely. So when I heard him, I thought, "Oh my gosh, there is a kindred spirit there." I need to reach <laughs> out to him, and I did. Good, good. Well, we're glad you did. And uh, unfortunately, he's unable to get in, so we uh, he's out uh, doing some apostolic work now. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some of these things that uh, that you encountered during your uh, during your tenure. Uh, on on Loveland uh, on the Loveland uh, PD, and we also I'm gonna uh, in, interject some things that happened to myself, uh, Luke, because I think that it's important for us to realize that that as time goes on and, and Catholics become more involved in their faith, uh, the recognition of evil in law enforcement has to be brought out, and I'm not sure what ultimately is gonna uh, be the result of that, but I think that uh, certainly we need to. We need to explore that a little bit. So let's do that today if we can. Uh, Al, so explain to us, uh, you know, initially, uh, I know you probably had a very 
typical Catholic upbringing, but can you uh, tell us a little bit where you a convert or a cradle Catholic? What what happened? How, how was uh, how was your beginnings? Eddie, I was born in 1960, and as you know, uh, 62, the Second Vatican Council got into gear, and my mother and father were Catholic. They baptized me Catholic. I was baptized in the font of the Cathedral of St. Mary in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and at that font, uh, now today, I frequently make pilgrimage is up there because Our Lady in statue form stands right above the font and looks down at all the children being baptized. Uh, but at the time, you know, the Baltimore Catechism really went away. The church didn't have a catechism. I was uh, among the millions of children in the 60s and 70s that were just poorly catechized, if at all. I remember my mother indicating to us seven kids later in our lives that because she really didn't know what to teach us anymore, she didn't teach anything. Mm. And so I was, I had a pulse in the pews. Um, when I was in high school, a friend of mine um, used to go to the back of the church, pick up a bulletin, and then drive down to Seven Eleven to get a Slurpee. And later on in my life, one of my birthdays, he gave me a little statue. He was a cowboy with a gun. And uh, he'd written on there, I, I think almost prophetically, death by Slurpee. Uh, <laughs> because we were cutting ourselves off from the sacraments to get, go get a Slurpee, and we didn't even know it. Yeah. But uh, later in life, uh, you know, I got married by the grace of God. I, I met a beautiful Catholic woman. And... She came from a wonderful family. I love her mother and father very much, still to this day. And it was important for her to get married in the church, and so we did, right in front of Jesus Christ in the tabernacle, although I didn't really recognize he was there. And uh, between 1986 and 1995, God blessed us with four sons. And because it was really important to my wife and it had been part of my muscle memory as a Catholic, we took them in to get them baptized. And then in 1997, I read a book, and it's amazing how God can use material like that. It was a, a book written by Bud McFarlane called Pierced by a Sword. I remember it well, yes. Book. Uh, then you know it's a fictional book, but it talks about the church in crisis, the church militant. Uh, armoring ourselves up with the sacraments in order to stay in the spiritual fight. And it changed my life. I, I fell deeply in love with the Mass. I fell deeply in love with the sacraments, especially reconciliation. And uh, about that time, I w had been promoted to uh, lieutenant. So I, was, uh, I had some management responsibilities inside the police department. And um, my thought processes and my strategic thinking all be started to become grounded in the idea that I was a servant of God in that blue suit and what should I do with the power of the Holy Spirit to be a good servant. Right. And you know, it's funny, uh, Luke, because you and I, I was born in 1961. So we had the, the, the same, you know, uh, beginnings as far as being Catholicism. I'm also a cradle Catholic. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that was a phenomenon happening around that time is that the Second Vatican Council kind of threw people off. They weren't sure how the church was going to proceed, and, and uh, people were not teaching, uh, giving pr proper catechesis to their, to their loved ones. So uh, I agree with you that this was going on at that time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I had I had uh, three sons and then a daughter, so we have some uh, some similarities. I want to see uh, a little bit uh, about uh, how how things came to be with with your family. Uh, one of the things I want to say because you, you said something about the Baltimore Catechism, and although it never did really <clears throat> go away, uh, it, it kind of faded off. But I think it's having a, a resurgence now. We'll, we'll get to that uh, in in a while, but. Uh, but so you described a little bit about how you started your law enforcement career, uh, how uh, you uh, went up in the ranks, let's say. And, uh, and we could, you know, I want to I ask you specifically about as you uh, ascended in the ranks, uh, how did your responsibility as a Catholic play itself out? In other words, how did that affect your, uh, 
your your leadership style, your your everyday decisions that you were making, uh, and, and and you know, it, it, like my uh, career progressed. I, I only went to sergeant; that was enough. But I, I'll tell you, I would have paid for a good Catholic, uh, a good Catholic uh, commander in chief at, at some point in my career. So why don't you explain to how, how it affected you uh, as far as your your leadership style, your your uh, everyday decision making process. I really put on the stars of police chief with fear and trembling, and I don't. I can't say Eddie that I ever felt comfortable uh, carrying the weight of those stars on my collar, except that every morning before I would go to work, I would stop at the church and kneel down in front of the tabernacle. And, and pray, and then during my tenure as the police chief, our church in Loveland, Colorado, was able to successfully run through a capital campaign and construct the first perpetual adoration chapel in northern Colorado at the time. And so my my mornings started out on, on my knees, and I was I would pray earnestly for the community. I would pray earnestly for the police officers and their families and for safety and the schools. And I hear the music. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Jesus 911. We'll be right back after these short messages. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Jesus 911, we're 10 8. Got a two man car. Got uh, myself, Sergeant Eddie Chavez, retired CHP. And we have retired Chief Luke Hecker from the Loveland, uh, Colorado Police Department. And uh, Chief, you were just describing something that was actually very inspiring. 
you're talking about as the chief now, uh, you're you're dealing with how to carry the responsibility uh, of being a police chief. And you describe how you went to church every morning on the way to work, and you stopped in there. And uh, continue with that story because we were kind of cut off uh, before the break. In the mornings, especially when the Adoration Chapel was built, uh, before I made any decision during the day, before I uh, sat down to do anything strategic around making police decisions, I would just kneel quietly in front of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament and contemplate the mysteries on the rosary and um, gave him all of today and the safety of our visitors in town, the safety of our staff in town, safety of our schools, and asked for the gift of the Holy Spirit then to go into my office and make decisions that were inspired by God and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's so, a, yes, go ahead. Really the methodology. That was the methodology of my uh, tenure as police chief. Well, that that's truly inspiring, chief. That's something that uh, that needs to be uh, copied around the uh, around the country because we don't have enough uh, enough of that right now. But let's let's go on with the. Uh, I want to ask you specifically about something that's kind of uh, very important to what we do here at Jesus Nine Hundred One. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Chief, we usually talk about spiritual warfare. So what I want to ask you about specifically is uh, working the streets as a police executive. And, and I, I know that you don't work as a chief on the street, but you're still involved with uh, uh, events that occur in the field. Uh, did you ever, uh, and if you did, uh, when was it that you realized that the devil was active in the community? I had a... <clears throat> Uh, really, it, it, my first front row glimpse to the devil in the community occurred, I think, when I was a lieutenant, and I was working the swing shift. At the time, we had a police officer that we had hired from a law enforcement agency in Texas, and he just had a larger-than-life personality. I, We were all drawn to him. He had a knack for finding criminals. Everybody would, you know, on our shift, including me, would oftentimes run to wherever the radio call took us, wherever the suspect was last seen. And this guy's name was Bob, and he would go two, three blocks away, get out of his car, and sit next to a fence and just listen. And nine times out of ten, he'd catch the bad guys. And uh, he was just, uh, he had, a, he was funny, charismatic, and a great cop. So we were all drawn to him. We went to a call one night after I was up in the north part of town. There was a person inside of a home that was shrieking unhuman screams out of their body. And uh, Bob got to the threshold of the door and then that southern draw said, I ain't going in there. <laughs> and Good choice. I'm like, Bob, what, what's up? He goes, there's, they, there's, that whatever's in there is not human. I, I ain't going through, I'm not going through there. And because he was such a brave guy and, a, you know, such a, a, a cop's cop, it really made a huge impact on me. And we could hear the screaming. Um, you know, eventually, of course, we had to, we had to go in and get hands on. And later on, I, in our my career, this type of behavior from people screaming uncontrollably, shrieking, making noises that are inhuman and really possessing inhuman strength got titled as uh, excited delirium, a psychological term. And uh, we were seeing a lot of it. I'm sure you saw a lot of that. And yes. what I really recognized is these, these there's demons uh, you know, in Luke's gospel, Jesus told Simon Peter, and he and he tell when he uses it, when he said when Jesus says something twice, he's swinging I think a pretty heavy bat, and so he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. And you know, Eddie, when you think about what it's like to be sifted like wheat, you you come out powder. 
you're, there's nothing left of you. And I, and I began to recognize that we're, we, we're calling stuff excited delirium and we're trying to give it a medical name and, and deal with it, and, but we're touching it. We're, we're putting it in our cars. We're bringing it into our booking rooms. Uh, we're hands-on with it. And it, it began to occur to me that if we're not armored up, like Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, that putting on the armor of, of God and standing firm against the tactics of the devil, because that's who we're dealing with. And if we're not armored up in the sacraments, if we're not prayerful before we go to work, if, if we're not in, engaged in, in regular reception of the Blessed Sacrament and participating in reconciliation and putting on this armor of God, we're, we're going into, police officers are going into the battle and they're ill-equipped. And, Eddie, this doesn't make sense from a very common sense perspective. Uh, we both know that from a physical perspective, police officers get it. They wear level three body armor on their chests. We put Kevlar pads in their car doors to protect them from uh, gunfire and ambushes uh, uh, in their vehicles. Uh, we, we would never send a, a SWAT team into a barricaded gunman call without all of their weaponry and all of their armor. And so we get it. We get this idea that, you know, physically, if we're going to preserve our lives, we've got to be armored up. Yes. Well, I became, I felt so lonely and like I didn't know what to do because the, the separation of church and state and even some of the aggressive pushback from police officers that didn't want anything to do with God or the church or the sacraments, uh, recognizing that, oh man, I've got men and women under my leadership that are exposed to not just the physical death, but the double death of losing their souls. And absolutely, absolutely. it's a great cross to carry. And I made many sacrifices and uh, offered many uh, penances and fasting for, this, for their souls. You know, Chief, you mentioned excited delirium. I want to explain for our, for our viewers what excited delirium is, because I did have some experience with that. Quite a bit, actually. Uh, excited delirium is is what is the term that, uh, uh, like you said, the medical profession or even psychologically, they put on an individual who is uh, about to be taken into custody, and there's uh, uh, there's inhuman things going on with him. For example, uh, like you you described, the shrieks. Uh, a lot of times, these people happen to have been uh, on on uh, on narcotics, on drugs. And they act in this in this fashion. Uh, there sometimes it takes three or four policemen to to physically restrain them. Uh, they're 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 foaming at the mouth, and and that term came out to be uh, chief because as you know, uh, they uh, uh, a lot of them began to to pass away to die uh, after they they were uh, hogtied in the back of a police car. At least on the west coast they did, and. Uh, and it was something that that uh, they felt a need to put a term on because uh, of of the extreme nature of of the condition of these individuals. And so that's what we're talking about: excited delirium. And these people uh, uh, display these things all the time. Whenever you have what we call here in in, in California fifty one fifty, it's a little uh, it's extreme, but that's what law enforcement terms it. And I agree with you, Chief, that that. Uh, that a lot of people, especially uh, law enforcement officers who who deal with these individuals, especially taking them into custody, uh, they're they're at, they're at a risk here that they're not unaware of. I think that, uh, like you said, that there's there's this uh, this um, unspoken rule that you take care of these things, you deal with them, and uh, some of them uh, might even be considered a, a, a little uh, fun to deal with. Uh, because of what happens, but uh, but yes, I think that uh, there there are s- certain things that police officers are not prepared for, and one of them being the spiritual battle that individuals that uh, display excited delirium, as well as other things that that are going on out there that uh, that haven't been uh, 
spiritually addressed. They've been they've been uh, addressed otherwise, but not spiritually, and that's what we're talking about today. Consider if you if you can, and this is really important for the police officers that are listening. How powerful touch is. For example, uh, when you were baptized, you were anointed. You, the, the sign of the cross was made upon your forehead with holy oil. Uh, when you were confirmed, if you were confirmed, you, when the bishop uh, called down the Holy Spirit to seal, seal your spirit, he put his hands on your head. When the bishop uh, ordains his priest, he conveys that power through touch. When we uh, take our brides and our, our grooms, uh, we reach out and hold each other's hands as the, the prayer of matrimony in the, the, the sacrament of our marriage is sealed in heaven. So we can't underestimate that when we're touching something or being touched by something, there's a lot of power there. And that power can be good, and it follows with reason that that power also can be evil. And police officers, by their sworn oath, are required to put their hands on a, a violator and take them into custody. They're, they, if they're not equipped spiritually for some of these things and and, and the demonic powers that they're reaching out and putting their hands on, if they're in a state of mortal sin while they're doing that, and, 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 it, and even if they're not in a state of mortal sin because the conditions of a mortal sin didn't exist, but they're engaged in behavior that would be mortal sin, if they knew the, the prerequisites of, of that sin, they are exposed in weakness, their armor is down, and the demon through touch can do some remarkable things that are not holy, that are not pure. And you start to, to then uh, do the studies on suicides among law enforcement and emergency service personnel, addiction and vice to so many things. And it's not very hard from a common sense perspective to start drawing some connecting lines. Absolutely. I agree 100%, Chief. They have to be fairly prepared to be able to deal with some of the things that we deal with out there. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Jesus 911. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment, you know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. That's you know, right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this, I just want to call all the people, you know, I got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money, and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless you, brother. You're amazing. We gotta. We have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the Divine Mercy Chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 29 years old, five kids, and I thank you guys. But everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I so love it. Out there. Hi, this is Eddie Chavez, host of Jesus 911. I want to take this opportunity to let you, our listeners, know about an event being held here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in Covina. We will be celebrating the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September 28th, 2019, beginning at 9 o'clock with Mass in the morning and the talks to follow. Ruben Nava and myself will be speaking, so come and hear us talk about St. Michael and Our Lady. Come join us, and we'll see you there.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we're 10-8. We're in service, clear for calls. Ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, interviewing uh, uh, retired Chief Luke Hecker from the uh, Loveland, uh, Loveland uh, PD in Colorado. Uh, and also, I think we have a uh, uh, a guest that wants to say hello. Uh, Jess, are you out there? Yeah. Hey, uh, t- I'm 10-8, guys. I'm here in Florida. <laughs> and I am thoroughly enjoying the interview with Brother Luke Hecker here. He's uh, he's definitely uh, he he's definitely speaks our language, Eddie. Yeah, absolutely. Chief, uh, can you uh, hear Jess? Yeah, I can. What a joy. Thank you. Of course, of course. Hey, well, Eddie, it looks like we're going to have to have Luke on over and over again because this guy, is, he speaks our language. He gets it. He understands that, that there's a, two primary evils. you got human evil, and then you got diabolical evil, and one supersedes the other. And it's, it's good to hear that there's another Catholic out there, ret, retired Catholic cop that's red-pilled, and he realizes that the battle that we're really fighting, as St. Paul says, it's against the principalities and powers of the air. So, Luke, I just want to just congratulate you. I'm listening to you here in Florida as I'm walking into the conference where I'm going to speak at, and uh, your testimony is spot on. Eddie, continue, dude. You're doing a good job interviewing him and, and drawing out all the proper questions. God bless you guys. I'm here enjoying your show from Orlando, Florida. All right, brother. God bless you, Jess. Thank you for I'm calling 10-7. in. All right. All right. See, if we were talking about the power of touch and how the Catholic Church uh, incorporates touching into several of the sacraments, and uh, I think that that's a, a, a point that we, we need to make, is that, you know, thank goodness that the, uh, the role of law enforcement is not, to, uh, is not to expel some of the demons that they may encounter, because uh, if that was the case, we'd be having a lot of, uh, a lot of police officers that were uh, would be uh, afflicted with with demons because they were trying to do something that the Catholic Church reserves specifically for uh, priestly ordination for for the priest to do. That's right. But but you're right, uh, uh, Chief, in 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 uh, uh, assessing that when we as police officers put hands on people, it's still it's still uh, there's still some effect spiritually speaking. There's still some effect. There's still some uh, uh, some uh, there's still a dynamic of, of, of getting this demon to a point where they're restrained uh, and, and the individual's uh, behaviors restrained. And so when we do that, there is something that's, that's, uh, that's kind of, it kind of lingers. It's in the gray area between uh, uh, reality, uh, physical reality and spiritual reality. And uh, that's the one thing that I want to ask you is that uh, did, uh, were you ever uh, of the opinion you know, this is not being a judgmental, but in my in my observations over the years, I think very few Catholic police officers were operating uh, in a state of grace uh, at any given time. Uh, I, I don't think that was the case. They they were they were more than likely in 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 some serious sin, maybe mortal sin. But my question to you is. Um, how how is it that these officers could uh, could get out there, do the things they did, and uh, uh, and survive it physically and and spiritually? Well, Eddie, there uh, we are provided, thanks be to God, with the tools to do that. The uh, power of the seven sacraments are the tip of the armor that. I believe St. Paul is speaking about, and being sealed by the Holy Spirit in our baptism, and then practicing our faith. 
Uh, again, we can uh, make the analogy of training and getting our, the training into our muscle memory, whether it's arrest control training, whether it's firearms training. But we, we spend a lot of time as police officers on the gun ranges and in our um, gyms working our bodies out and building in that muscle memory to practice. And how important then is it to be practicing Catholics and pro football teams, Super Bowl champions, they don't practice once a week. They, they practice every single day, multiple times a day. And we really have an opportunity in the police profession to armor ourselves up if we have, to the extent that we have an opportunity to go to daily mass and receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament with, our, our, with a pure heart. Uh, and uh, if not, to participate in the, the sacrament of reconciliation and get rid of the, the baggage, especially the mortal sins that put up a mortal barrier between us and God, uh, keeping ourselves spiritually strong by recognizing that our conscience is clear by the grace of God through that sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, our, I Frequently, uh, when I was working uh, I would speak publicly, and people would want to know if I was in plain clothes, if I was armed. And I would say, oh, yes. And I'd draw my rosary from my pocket. <laughs> and I would say that, you know, this is a 50 caliber machine gun with uh, magazines, ten, 10 magazines each on, on between the beads. And it's a very, very powerful weapon for armoring ourselves up and participating in meditating and grafting ourselves into the life of Christ as we, as we contemplate those mysteries. And the, the power every single day that occurs at, during the 3 o'clock hour, when uh, Jesus, by the grace and gift of his Father and participation with him, uh, it's, it's the moment of the exaltation of the cross, uh, the moment in history that Satan hates the most because at that moment that Jesus gave up his life on the cross and said it is finished, Satan recognized what he was saying, that he's finished. And so at the 3 o'clock hour, uh, I would set my watch and um, participate to the extent I could in the chaplet of the Divine Mercy. And um, we would pray at home. Uh, my wife and I would pray the rosary, and before I would leave the home, my home in the morning, my wife would bless me, uh, making the sign of the cross on my forehead, and I would bless her as well. And at night, uh, before our kids went to bed, I would uh, oftentimes take holy oil or bless them on the forehead as well and say, may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. May the guardian angels sleep with you, love you, and protect you all night long. Amen. And we can do this as, as fathers, uh, armored up as police officers. Uh, we we become, again, by the grace of God, something like Saint Joseph and the and the, the fathers of our of our families, holy families at home, and we're being restored at home. And our wives are loving us, and we're being loved, and we're participating in the sacraments and being charged back up to go into our next tour of duty and deal with whatever evils may come our way, not by our strength, but by the grace of God. Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, Chief. You know what? Some of the same things that were going on in, in your life at the same time were going on in my life. I remember uh, I had a wife and, and mother and a grandmother that would pray uh, three rosaries for me a day uh, during my, my tours uh, in the field. And, uh, and you know what? The reality is those things do work. Uh, they are uh, much more stronger than a, a 50 caliber uh, uh, machine gun like you mentioned. Chief, I wanted to ask you something specific here. I wanted to ask you about uh, what types of things did you witness in the community and within the police department itself that you viewed as demonic? I know there was, um, uh, you know, and, and I want you to talk about uh, about uh, the perpetrators, but I also want you to talk about some of the things that were going on with the police uh, uh, staff too. Now, how many sworn was Loveland? Right at about 100 when I retired. Okay. And so talk a little bit about, about that, uh, that aspect of uh, what you viewed as demonic at that time.
at one point, unfortunately, we had to separate the employment of a police officer for cause. And after that officer had separated from the department, we went to the computer files that the officer had saved to determine whether there was anything of criminal records that we needed to preserve on there. And I was alarmed when I started to read some of the texts that had been downloaded onto that computer and dialogue with the demonic and really uh, inviting the demonic inside the walls of the organization. And at about that time, we had a detective that was doing a, a, a remarkable job working uh, cyber crimes. And unfortunately, he got on to the um, cyber trail of one of our officers that was involved in sex crimes uh, on the Internet. And uh, we ended up having to take that officer into custody, and that officer went to jail. Uh, shortly thereafter, we had another officer that got involved in domestic problems at home and allegations of child abuse, and that officer went to jail, although he was later exonerated in the courts. And um, there was a tremendous amount of tension that, you know, the devil doesn't like unity. He really uh, is the, the great deceiver. So there was tensions that were forming even inside the department. I would, uh, on Tuesday nights, bring the Magnificat with me into the city council chambers and catch up on the reading uh, of all the different saints, the different meditations that are provided in that book on a daily basis, things that I maybe didn't get a chance to read during the week. And uh, I, I received some written anonymous criticism about violating the church and state and carrying that Magnificat with me into a government building and praying while I was at the city council meetings. And some of that criticism came right from within the walls of uh, the police department. And I hear the music again. Yeah, yeah, you hear the music. I, that's interesting because I, I do want to ask you a little bit about how you uh, how you got away, I'll, I'll say that in quotations, how you got away with some of the Catholic things you did on duty. And then I want to talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, some of the officer misconduct. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Jesus 911. This is Jesse Romero. And I'm Terry Barber. From the Terry and Jesse Show. And we invite you to listen to the Holy Hour of Power, High Energy Catholic Radio. We're two Catholics with a PhD in common sense. We're on Monday through Friday on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. But we're going to give you as masculine Catholic teachings on the faith. You know, we say we're too inspired to be tired, we're too protected to be dejected, and we're too renewed to be subdued. Why? Because we believe in Jesus Christ and His Bride, the Church. And we will take each issue of the day and show you how the Catholic Church has the answer for our culture. What we really do is bring men back into the Catholic Church, which it's about time to do. We want men to be leaders in their Catholic faith so that they can bring their family to heaven. Our program is not right versus left, it's right right versus wrong and our program is where catholicism and culture intersect it's high energy catholic radio we're gonna inspire you to fall deeper in love with jesus christ and his bride to the church the terry and jesse show on the virgin most powerful app genesis 127 says god created man in his own image male and female he created them according to pope saint john the 23rd it is not true that some human beings are by nature superior and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in His image and likeness and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we're 10-8 for our last segment. It's a two-man car. I have uh, the chief riding with me, retired chief uh, Luke Heckler from uh, the Loveland, Colorado Police Department. Uh, chief, we were talking about some officer misconduct, and... Uh, you you ran a couple different scenarios by us of how the officers got into um, into trouble. Is there was there any direct evidence or or was it your opinion, for example, that that some of these people because of the their duty assignments or because of uh, uh, because of things going on during their tours of du- of duty actually led them into this uh, uh, terrible behavior that you described? I can't say that definitively, Eddie. I can tell you that I certainly perceived that, and I I prayed earnestly for them, recognizing that so many of them I knew were not practicing the Catholic faith or any faith. Right. And so I knew that they they certainly were vulnerable to evil and. Uh, our, the department was not exempt from the same things that I'm sure you saw in yours. We ha- had so many broken up marriages. We had so many acts of infidelity. And, uh, you know, the worst things that would happen was when w- there was infidelity in the walls of, of, the, of the department and um, officers betraying each other or, or staff betraying each other by hooking up with each other's um, spouses. And, uh so it, I recognized it was sinful behavior, and I then logically uh, drew the connection to the potential for the demonic to be at work, uh, especially after being invited into the walls of the organization by one of the staff members. And so I was always... Uh, making prayers and sacrifices personally to the extent that I could for our staff, for their protection spiritually. Yes, yes, I agree. And, and you know, I, I remember a, a phrase, and it's not very complimentary to, to law enforcement, but I remember people saying that there were more lo- there's more loyalty among thieves than police, than police officers because of the things that were going on. And this is, this is what you're describing. You're describing as something that's going on uh, even amongst the police department uh, uh, sworn uh, sworn officers that uh, that became problematic and became a very a, a very much a distraction in the workplace. Did you ever experience that, uh, Chief? Yes, uh, I did. <clears throat> and I and then on the on the community side, Eddie, we right before I retired, somebody. We actually took one person into custody. I'm not sure if this person was responsible for all of the killings and the shootings, but somebody began to drive around the community just randomly shooting um, residents. And it not only occurred in Loveland, but it occurred in northern Colorado. And you may, you may remember that time right around 2015 because northern Colorado was in the national news at the time. And um, people were getting their windows shot out on I-25. One poor woman was shot right through the neck while she was driving on I-25. Yes. We lost the life of a Loveland resident at about 1130 uh, on a night in June when he couldn't sleep and he went out for a walk and the suspect rolled past him one way, turned around, came back uh, towards him with the driver's side window closest to the curb where the man was walking and shot in point blank range with a shotgun and killed him. And 
so when I told you earlier that the, that I just the devil wasn't hiding his face, I, I I never saw him physically, but I certainly saw him spiritually active in the department and in the community. I agree. I agree. And you know, you know what, Chief, and I'm sure you experienced this as well, is that a lot of times when uh, there's innocent victims of things, and sometimes they're not so innocent, but sometimes they are. And sometimes the reality of, of these crimes that occur um, really weigh heavily on, on some of the, uh, the rank and file. Uh, you know, you had a uh, uh, what we would call a smaller department based on, on, on Los Angeles. But still, because you were out there, I mean, there was there were there were uh, there were things that we bore as police officers that people didn't realize that sometimes if they're not living in a state of grace can cause these uh, acts of misconduct, these these uh, uh, life uh, traumas and and and. Uh, things of that nature to become prevalent in, in our lives. And even though the public doesn't see it, it's something that we as police officers has to, have to uh, address. We have to begin to uh, address them in a spiritual way uh, because of the things that are going on in life uh, and, and, and in the police department are so, um, they're actually, they're, they're actually uh, tear lives apart. And so there, where, where there has to be, where there's spiritual issues, there has to be a spiritual uh, redress. Don't you believe that? I do. And that's why I am so overwhelmed and joy-filled with the ministry that you men have in California. And even listening to the commercial breaks and the um, conferences where you gather under the mantle of Our Lady and uh, St. Michael the Archangel, and pray together. Uh, how very powerful, and I, I commend you. This, this is vital officer safety. It's as vital as any physical training that a police officer can undertake, and I commend you for that. I, I also think it's powerful that after Jesus told Simon, and again telling him twice, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, that later on in, in his own writing in First Peter, he, Peter uh, chapter 5, he indicates that the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. And that's our men and women. Uh, they're, they, they really are noble people. They want to do the right thing in their communities. They, they have a common heart for the service of the common good, and they work hard to know who their adversary is physically, and it's a very, very important that they recognize that they have a demonic spiritual adversary as well and that they're geared up and trained up and armored up to, for officer survival around both their physical and spiritual life. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, that the verse that you, you quoted there about the devil prowling around like a roaring lion, I always noticed that at the beginning of that, prowling around. So when, when the devil is prowling around, he's not overtly doing that. He's prowling around means kind of lying in wait for your prey. That's exactly what what the devil does. And then he, he, he's on the hunt. Exactly. He's on the hunt. And, and, and we humanity are, are what he's hunting. And, and as soon as police officers can be aware of that, uh, and, 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 and take this into their, into the physical reality. Like you said, the training is so important. Uh, I'm, I was so thankful for all the, all the training we received, uh, on, on the, on the department, but also, but also some of the training I received from my parish, uh, and, and that was that was even more uh, more meaningful to me because it had eternal consequences. Can you talk a little That's bit about correct. that? Yeah, That's correct. You know, when Jesus told his disciples that, you know, they, they can't they can take your physical life, but his desire, his thirst for us is to be with him in eternal life at the at the eternal banquet in the kingdom of heaven. And to the extent that, that somebody can ambush us uh, and police officers uh, while they're out there nobly carrying out their duties, it's a crime. Uh, it, it's, 
it's horrific when it occurs, uh, but please God, that that police officer wouldn't die the double death and lose their soul eternally and be separated from God eternally, but that they would be armored up to the extent that all the suspect could do is harm them physically, but cannot touch them for eternal life. Yes, I agree. That's that's the most important thing, and 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 uh, so what we have to what we have to realize, I think, as as police officers that 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 understand the reality of what's happening there is that is that we have to push, even in our own way, in in our own uh, uh, brotherly love, uh, brother and sisterly love that we have out there. I think we have to push uh, understanding. Even for non-Catholics, I mean, this happens to Catholics and non-Catholics alike on, on duty. That that uh, we are dealing with with uh, uh, eternal uh, consequences when we conduct our life in, in in certain ways, and this is what we're talking about. We're talking about remaining in a state of grace, so that uh, so that we can be uh, physically protected, but spiritually as well. That's correct. You know the. Uh... There's a great image, I think it's in Psalms 13, and it, 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 the psalmist is begging for the strength and, and love and mercy of God, lest the adversary sit, stand over his grave and bragging that he's conquered, he, he, the psalmist, us. Yes. And uh, we, police officers, yes. Eddie, we have the tools. It's so important for Catholic police officers to to be engaged in practicing fervently their faith, participating in the sacraments, running to the sacrament of reconciliation when our armor is weakened by the sins that we selfishly commit, being geared back up, re-armored, and and being sent out there. Um, Please, God, know that that when we die physically from natural causes in our lives or if we surrender our lives in service to our community as police officers, that our adversary, the devil, is never able to stand on top of our grave, stick his foot in our face and say, I have conquered him. He, be- he belongs eternally to me. Rather, that we, in- we, when we draw our last breath, what we hear our Lord and Master say is, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into your eternal reward. Amen. Amen, Chief. You uh, have no disagreement with us here. That's for sure. Thank you, uh, Chief. We're going to have you back. I'm sure Jess is, uh, wants a crack at you as well. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll put you on hold until next time we speak, okay? Thank you so much. God bless you. And God bless God the bless people of, uh, of Colorado and Loveland, Loveland uh, PD. Likewise. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. We'll be in touch. Ladies and gentlemen. Jesus 911. Uh, we uh, stay, stay tuned for Gary Machuda with uh, Hands On Apologetics. Uh, we uh, will be back next week. And so until then, we'll stay St. Michael the Archangel. Pray for us. God bless you. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.